All right, well, here is another ZV-427MG9. It's a Magnavox DVD VCR by Funai, and it has a letter attached to it. As you will see, I'm a detailed person. This is a Magnavox VHS DVD unit, ZV-427MG9A, serial number, blah, blah, blah. The remote, as you requested, is in a Ziploc bag on the back of the unit. I went to load a VHS tape the other day, and I noticed that once I inserted the tape, the unit would not pull it and finish the loading process. The red power light was on at the time, then in about 13 seconds, the power light went off. Pushing the power button on again, the red power light came back on. The counter lights display, and again, about 13 seconds, the power went off again. Also notice that you get a power back on. You could also push the play button on the DVD side. You can hear the DVD side perform a start run sequence, and ready for a disc. By the way, I rotated the shaft on the tape loading motor by finger and it pulled the tape in and down to the play position. I reversed it and it pulled the tape up and out of the machine. This told me the loading mechanism should be okay, not binding in or out. I think it must be an electrical issue. I removed the cover and cleaned the two side sensors and the two front lower sensors by removing the clear tower held in place by one screw. Powered back up, tried loading the tape, same thing. And the unit went off again in about 13 seconds. The drive motor for the loading sequence of the tape never ran. I didn't think the power going off had anything to do with the tape loading as it was on for 13 seconds, long enough to load the tape before shutting off. Good luck. If you YouTube this job, I'd like to watch the repair. Please return using UPS Ground Simple, same way I sent to you. Thanks. Note, about four years ago, it quit powering up. I located a glass fuse located on the right bottom side. It was bad. Replaced the fuse. It has played good up until now. Figured it took a hit during a storm. Okay, well, that's a little bit of a story. So let's go ahead and plug it in, pop the top, and we'll see what it does. All right, so I got the top off just taking a look around in this thing. And this thing is absolutely immaculate inside. Not even any dust back here on the fan blades. It is just pristine inside. So we'll go ahead and power it up. We'll try to put a tape in it and see what kind of results we get. Well, the customer certainly is a stickler for details. Power on. Red light came on. I get nothing trying to put a tape in it. No loading motor movement whatsoever, but I do hear the DVD mechanism over here doing something. You hear it clunking, and then nothing ever happens on the VHS side. If you block the infrared emitter right here with your fingers, it thinks you're trying to put a tape in, but nothing ever happens. I hear the fan running back here. You can't see it, but the cooling fan is running. Well, let's go ahead and pop the DVD mechanism out of this unit, and we'll take a peek over here at the power supply, which lives up underneath the DVD mechanism. Okay, well, I've unsoldered the positives of all the filter caps on the power supply. I'm just going to do a quick ESR check. That one's a half an ohm. What value is it? Yeah, it's a 22, so that's probably okay. There's the main filter cap. Perfect. Uh, two ohms. Let's check the value of that one. Uh, that's a 10 at 50, so that's probably okay. And we have one more back here in the startup circuitry. That's another two ohm capacitor. What's the value of that one? It's a little tiny guy. It's another 10 at 16, so that's perfectly fine. So all the caps in the power supply check perfectly fine. 
All right, so looking around here, I'm looking at this transistor Q1057. This is the five volt switching transistor. And so it takes the about 12 volts and regulates it down to five volts and it sends it over here to power on five volt parentheses one. So looking over here at this schematic, this is one of seven. The other one was seven of seven. So the power on five volts parentheses one, if I follow that line, goes up here and it goes over to here power on 5 volts parentheses 1 it goes to the capstan motor so let me show you what I found on that so here is Q1057 so let me get my ohmmeter out and we'll do some ohm checks collector base and emitter I'm not sure quite what the orientation is I haven't looked it up but I know that R1065 is connected to the base so I believe this is the base so this is probably the collector and this is the emitter right here okay so I'm on ohms if I measure from the base to ground I get about 1.5k that's perfectly fine let's go ahead and bend this over so I can get my leads in here if I measure from the collector to ground I get 1.5k that's perfectly fine but if I measure from the emitter to ground I get 0.7 ohms that's bad so the next thing I'm going to do is pull the mechanism out of this unit right here and this connects directly to the capstan motor we'll see if the short is on the capstan motor Okay, so with the ohm meter, let's measure on the capstan motor. Pin one to ground, pin two to ground, because that's where my short is. And then down here, we'll measure pin 11, which is the 12 volt source, the 18 volt source to ground. Okay, so here's the capstan motor ribbon cable right here. This is pin one. So I get 592 ohms. There's pin two, that's the one I suspect is the problem. Point 7 to 0.8 ohms and then no short there and no short there so why is pin 2 measuring shorted is it the capstan motor that's actually shorted or is it a peripheral component so next I need to unsolder this connector completely off of the board and then I can go ahead and determine is it the capstan motor itself that's got the problem or is it something on the board that is shorted. Okay, so I have the capstan motor unsoldered from the board. So let's go ahead and check pin 2 again to ground. And I still get 0.7 ohms. So that tells me the problem is on the main board. It's not on the capstan motor itself so that's very good news so now I just have to troubleshoot and find out what might be shorted on the circuit board I see capacitor C 1544 220 microfarad 6.3 volts and that's on that line to ground so I'm gonna to have to try to find that cap and unsolder it because I follow the line back down here go across the bottom there's nothing else. Let's look at the diagram of seven of seven. So here's the switching transistor. And it goes right into power on five volt parentheses one. There's no peripheral components there. So let's try to find that 220 microfarad capacitor and see if it is the culprit. So there it is, C1544. So I'm gonna go ahead and unsolder one side of it and we'll see what the ohms check when it's unsoldered. Just for the heck of it, let's put the ohm meter back up here. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. 0.7 ohms to ground and 0.4 ohms to ground on the ground side of it. So let's go ahead and unsolder the positive lead from it and see if that's where the problem is. All right, so I have the positive lead unsoldered as you can see, and if I measure the pad now, I get 1.3 meg ohms, 1.3 million ohms. Once again, let's check the ground side of it, 0.3. We'll check the positive side of it, and look at that, 0.6 ohms. If I measure the pad, 1.3 million ohms. But if I touch the lead, it's a dead short. So let's take that cap out and we'll verify one more time that it is the culprit. All right, so there is the capacitor out of the circuit. So let's go ahead and measure it. So 
So I've got my positive lead on the positive, it doesn't really matter, and here's the negative lead, and I get 0.6 ohms. If I short my leads together, I get 0.4 ohms. So this is a 3 tenth, 2 or 3 tenth of an ohm capacitor at this point. It is bad. That is the culprit. 220 at 6.3. Well, let's see if I have under the 220. I can slam in here and then we'll fire this unit back up and see if we get favorable results. There may be some damage. That transistor may have been damaged by the shorted capacitor. We won't know until we put a new one in and find out. So just to show you what a new capacitor should check like, this is a brand new 220 at 6.3. I'm not sure the brand, KSC, it's a 105C rated capacitor. Um, I just call them Chinacon caps because they're cheap Chinese crap, but they get the job done. So we'll go ahead and do an ohm check on this one. And it's probably just my fingers actually reading this, so let me not touch that. And we get about 14 million ohms. So the original capacitor was a 220 at 6.3, but it was only an 85 degrees Celsius rated capacitor. All right, new capacitor in the board. We'll solder one lead. I'm going to stand up the other lead just to reduce stress on the body of the capacitor. And then I'm going to heat the first lead back up and stand it up straight. That way there's no stress on the lead of the capacitor at all. And then I'm just going to go ahead and trim the leads. There we go. New cap installed, ready to go. Next, I'm just going to go ahead and solder this capstan motor ribbon cable back to the board. So I'm just going to flow some solder across these pins, just like that. And then just tack them down. There we go, just like new. All right, so there's a close-up of the pins. There's no solder bridges between any of them. Well, unfortunately, I still get nothing. So here's the collector of the transistor. I get about 11 volts on it. Here's the base, 10.4, and this is the emitter, absolutely zero volts. So I'd say that transistor was damaged. Let's go ahead and pull that transistor out of the board and we'll do a quick test with the transistor checker and see if it's any good. And then we'll put a new transistor in here and see if we get better results. Okay, so I have the transistor in my MK168 transistor tester. Let's go ahead and power it up. Testing. Pin 2 to pin 3 is 49.9 ohms. Well, that is definitely bad. Okay, let's go ahead and power it up. Power on. Turn the power on. It's in the VCR mode already. Let's go ahead and try to put a tape in it, see if it accepts the tape at this point. Now it is still torn apart and I do have ambient light shining into the light sensors on each side so it might mess things up. Oh, but look at that, it took the tape. It loaded the tape. Let's hit play. I don't have a monitor connected, but it looks like it's going to play the tape just fine. Stop. Let's hit rewind. So the sound you're hearing is because I don't have the mechanism mounted. If it's mounted, then it's going to lift up just a little bit like that. Because the capstan motor is actually touching the circuit board right now. Stop, eject. Awesome, working perfect. Let's go ahead and put it back together. We'll clean the VHS mechanism, we'll clean the optical pickup, and I'll get this unit ready to ship back to my customer, I believe back in Georgia. Okay, let's go ahead and clean the optical pickup for the DVD. I have a cotton swab right here, moistened with regular glass cleaner. It's not saturated, and I'm just gonna go ahead and clean the lens in a circular motion. 
while rotating the cotton swab. Next I'm just going to go ahead and dry it off the same way. Very light pressure rotating the cotton swab. Alright, DVD player lens cleaned. Alright, now we'll go ahead and give the VCR a quick cleaning. And yes, we will introduce some acetone to the situation. And I know people are going to tell me, you can't use acetone to clean this, you can't use acetone to clean that. Well, I'm here to tell you that I've been doing VCRs since the early 80s, and I've used acetone and cotton swabs for all of those years with no adverse conditions. And they're going to tell me, well, it eats the enamel from the head leads. No, it does not. I've soaked the enamel coated leads in acetone for weeks at a time and it did not eat the enamel. So make sure that when you're cleaning this that you clean in a horizontal motion only to wipe the video heads and the cylinder drum. You don't want to clean in an up and down motion to clean the video heads itself. The drum you can wipe up and down, but just to be safe, I always go in a horizontal motion. As you can see, I'm rotating the video drum to clean the drum assembly and the heads at the same time. I'm just wiping the heads, and I normally don't wipe the heads out here with the cotton swab. I try to wipe them up here where it's much more concentrated because they will actually snag but like I said, I've been doing this since the early 80s. Never had any adverse reaction to cleaning heads with acetone. So coming up on 40 years of doing this, and it's been working perfectly. I'm going to clean the lower cylinder assembly now. I'm going to wipe off the entire tape path. And next we'll come around and we'll clean the fully raised head over here the entrance tape guide, the angle guides, the back tension arm assembly, the exit tape guide, the audio control head, the audio is on top, the control heads on the bottom, and the audio erase head, which is this black head over here, really hard to see with the capacitor right in the way. We'll clean this tape guide that leads from the audio head to the capstan shaft. I'll clean the pinch roller assembly and the capstan shaft and the exit tape guide as well all with acetone and all with the cotton swab. But I'm going to speed up the uh, video so it doesn't take so long. All right, the tape path is all clean. Let's put the unit back together. We'll pop a VHS tape in it. We'll pop a DVD back, do some final tests, and then I will get ready to ship this back to my customer in Georgia. All right, so we'll pop a disc in it. We'll let this load. I'll cut the loading part off because it takes so long. We'll hit play. There it is, some home videos that I took back in the mid 80s. Transferred over from VHS to DVD, so the DVD player is working perfectly. Let's go ahead and stop that. We'll switch it to VCR. I'll pop a tape in it. Now hit play. There it is playing just fine. It plays the VHS tape no problem whatsoever. So that's it. It's up and running. It works fine. So I want to give a sincere thank you to those who have supported my channel with a donation via PayPal or by having me repair your unit. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel and liking this video. It really helps my channel grow. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me, norcal715videos at gmail.com. Go ahead and leave me a comment, a question, a concern down below. I try to read all the comments and respond when I have time. Remember, with your help, we can keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everybody, thanks for watching this video. Once again, I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye-bye.